Today we are going to look at a demonstration of th basic three-point lighting. Uh, we are going to take uh, our subject, Carissa, and we are going to light this uh, as you might if you were in an office location, a home location, really kind of anywhere where you might have to do an interview. And so what I wanna do first is just kind of look at what we have for our natural light in the studio. Does that look like a good picture? What's wrong with, the, what's wrong with, this, with this image? It's flat. Yeah, it's got no dimension. Our light's coming from above, and obviously we have really high ceilings here, uh, but if we were in an office space, we'd create those raccoon eyes where the, the brow creates a shadow right under the eyes, and that's not going to look good. And obviously we want to make our talent look as good as they possibly can, right? So, uh, first thing I want to do before we get into the actual lighting is let's talk about the eye line really quick. If you guys remember from... Uh, class period, we were talking about where do you place the eye line? And if we were to put our eye line right here where she's looking right at the camera, that might be really good for news and if somebody is talking directly to the audience. But if this was a commercial or if this was a uh, piece of uh, conversation that, that two people were having at a, at a lunch counter, this might be kind of disturbing for the audience to have the subject looking directly at them. So. One of the first things I'm gonna do is because I wanna not make this a flat image, I'm going to move this off to the side so we can get a little bit of a dimension, okay? And even then, if we have the talent look at the, at the lens, right, that's still disturbing. So the next thing we wanna do is, where is that eye line going to be? If I'm gonna be conducting the interview, go ahead and turn towards me, you can even shift your whole body. How attached to this person are you? Not very much, but if I move here, what about now? How is that connection? Maybe a little bit better, right? What about if I'm right here? How is that? That's, the person's not looking at the camera, but they are uh, close enough to the camera's eye line to where it can be a little bit more natural um, uh, of a conversation that you might have with somebody. So if you are a photographer and you're going out to do an interview with a reporter, Try to have that reporter as close to the camera as possible, as close to the camera lens as possible. And the other thing is, if you and I are talking, how weird does that look? Where she's looking up at the person she's talking to. That looks a little weird. So the next thing that you wanna do is you wanna make sure that your reporter or whoever that's conducting the interview is at the same level as the, as the, cam as the uh, subject that you're interviewing, okay? That's gonna make things look really good. Why don't you hand me that uh, C-stand right there. So for today, we're gonna to use this C-stand as our subjects, as our, our reporter or the per person conducting the interview. Um, one thing I like to do is try to get that reporter as close to the lens as possible. So I will often have the lens like right over the shoulder of the person conducting the interview, okay? So if you would, whenever we're looking, just look right here at the, at the top. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we obviously need to bring some light into this scene. And our principal source of light is called the key light, okay? Key light, principal source of illumination. We are going to use these Omni lights. Now, I mentioned the other day in class that these are quartz halogen lights. What else did I mention about these kinds of lights? Well, you do need to put something over it, but what else? Is this a hard light or a soft light? Well, let's find out. Here comes the light. Pretty glaring, right? Pretty bright. Look at those shadows. Go ahead and bring that iris down a little bit. There you go. Um, would you say that this is a hard light or a soft light? This is a hard light, right? This is a point light. It puts out a lot of bright light. Uh, we can use this, there's nothing wrong with using a hard light, and we're gonna use the hard light, uh, these lights in class, uh, but I just want you to see very quickly what kind of shadows the hard light produces. Okay, now, these lights do have the ability to kind of flood out a little bit, so there it is completely spotted in, and it's pretty bright, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 
So here it is uh, flooded out. It's a little softer, but it's still a hard light. Does everyone see that? Yeah? Okay. Let's, let's take a look at some soft lights really quick. So uh, if someone will quickly bring me the, let's bring in the LED light really quick. And then let's get these other lights queued up and ready to go. So this is an LED kit that you guys are uh, able to check out. This is a one by one, or I, actually I think it's probably a 10 by 10, right? Uh, so uh, these have the ability to run off battery or run off of, um, um, boy, this is not, run off battery or run off electricity. Uh, they also have a dimmer, so we can go from 100% down to 0% if you would. Uh, go ahead and turn off the light really quick for me, just so we can see a little bit of a difference here. Now, what do you notice is a little different from the light we had a moment ago to the light we have now? Is this softer or is it harder? I mean, it can't be harder than the light we had. This light is a little bit softer. It's not, it's not, and that's because we are just getting a little bit bigger in size. Uh, I'm going to dial this color into orange so we can actually dial whatever color temperature we want. We've talked about color temperature before. This is a little bit softer. It's not as bright on your face, is it? No. Uh, it's a little bit softer, but we can go softer still. Go ahead and turn the light on. I'll turn this off. And so this light, the... Um, the LED light, as I said, is LED, so it can uh, run off very little power, um, and it's not going to heat up. This light right here, this is one of my lights, this is a fluorescent light, so it's got a bunch of fluorescent bulbs in here using a soft box. Uh, I'm just going to turn these on, and let's go ahead and turn off the light again. I think there's maybe... Oh yeah, there's two of these bulbs that are burned out, so I probably should check that ahead of time. But what do you notice about this light? This is a lot softer. Notice how the light is starting to wrap around the subject's face. And those shadows are starting to get a lot softer than they were a moment ago. All right, let's try one more light. Now this final light this one's going to get really bright. So one thing that you should probably get in the habit of doing anytime you're turning on a light is to announce that you are turning on the light to everyone in the studio so that they're, or the location that you're at so that they know a light is about to go on so they're not looking right at the light. And to do that, uh, you simply say, striking the light. And we turn it on. Now this is at 100%. And it's going to take a moment for this one to warm up just a little bit. But notice the size of this light dome compared to the um, fluorescent light that I had before and the small tiny LED light. This is an LED light too, so this is not going to get really, really hot. But look at how soft that light is now. Really wraps around the face. It's probably a little bright though. This one we can also dim down. Knock this down to about 50%. Go ahead and adjust your iris. That's a little bit more comfortable, right? Yeah. But look how soft that light is. When we have a soft light, we're removing a lot of the texture from the scene. We're flattening our image out. We're creating nice soft shadows, and we're creating a nice transition from one side of the face to the other. So know the difference between a hard light and a soft light. Let's go ahead and turn that back on. I just wanted to bring these lights out, these uh, soft lights out for you, just so you had an idea of what lights you, or some of the availability of lights uh, that you might have. But we're going to light this scene with just hard lights. Uh, the next thing that we need to talk about is where do we place the lights, right? I've got a little light mounted on the front of the camera, and you might see this a lot in news. I'm gonna just turn this on, here it comes. Now this is a tiny light. It's not really bright, so the throw distance, we talk about the inverse square law, how that's going to, throw, uh, to, to be reduced after time. But what do you think of this light? Some thoughts. Yeah, it's, it, first of all, it is very subtle. But then when you do start looking at it, a couple of things. 
Notice that there's the shadow right under the chin is really hard and it's right under the chin. So it makes it hard to really get a lot of features out of the subject, uh, a lot of distinguishing fe features out of the subject. This might be good as, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, as an eye light. But for right now, putting this right in front of the camera, right in front of the subject, is really good for glamour lighting. You see this a lot with uh, YouTubers. You see this a lot with um, uh, fashion photography. But for video, we've really flattened all the features out in this image by placing the light right here in the front. So I'm going to just turn this off for the moment. And we're going to come back to this one, light on. Notice I also put my hand in front of this light so that if something were to happen, if this, remember we talked about how uh, quartz halogen lights could explode, it's going to hit my hand. It's not going to hit the subject. And my hand is probably not as important as the actor or actress and them using their looks uh, for their jobs. Okay? So we want to be aware of that. So where do we place this camera? Or where do we place this key light? If we were to put it right here, really bright, really not flattering. Some people might say, well, what about if we place it all the way off to the side? I mean, you could, but look how, it's all the way off. Look at how distinct or look how, um, look at how split the face is where we have a light side and a dark side. Go ahead and turn off the lights again. I mean, this could be something that you might want to use if you were trying to be super dramatic but for an interview, probably not. And for traditional three-point lighting, probably not. You know, the key light can be placed anywhere you want. If uh, we were doing an investigative report, whoops, we are out of space, uh, but I'll just do this. If we were doing an investigative report, we could put the light completely behind our subject and cast her in silhouette, right, to where we're only outlining her features, but we really can't see her face. But a good place to start with any three-point lighting setup is the 45-45 placement. So if we are looking at the line from the camera to the subject and then the line from the subject to the light, putting it at about 45 degrees and tilting it down at about a 45 degree angle, Move it this way just a little bit more. Is a great place to start. And the reason why I say this is a great place to start is because the shadows that are created here give a lot of depth and dimension to the subject's face. Uh, we see the neck casting the shadow down, or sorry, the chin casting the shadow down onto the neck. So we get some depth there onto the features. The nose is casting a shadow, and because of the placement of the light, we get this little triangle of light right under the eye. You see this a lot in paintings, uh, uh, especially the, the Rembrandt, this is called Rembrandt lighting, uh, because Rembrandt would, would paint the light so that we get this little triangle of light right under the eye, okay? We could place the light here. This is perfectly fine. This is a good place to start. Um, and then depending on the light situation, that you are about to enter into, you might be asking, well, can I put this on the opposite side of the camera? Does it always have to be on the right side of the camera? And the answer is no, okay? So let's go ahead and bring another light out. Somebody go ahead and kill that light, would you please? Light on. You can go ahead and turn that light off. Yep, thank you. So again, we're going to hit at the 45, 45 angle. Oops, there it is. Let it out. And again, we're looking right here. Okay. All right. This looks maybe a little bit better because now we see a little bit more of the uh, opposite side of the face. Which one do you guys like more? Get ready to turn that one off. We're just going to flip these lights, so be ready. Go ahead. So we've got uh, 
option A right here, or option B, go ahead and turn that one off, right here. What do you guys like more? You like B? Let's do it again. Here's, here's A, and here's B. Now we can, you know, part of the brightness on our face is because we adjust the iris and also because of the, uh, we've probably spotted out or flooded out that light a little bit much, but. So which one do you like? Because based on your answer, that's how we're gonna structure the rest of this demonstration. So B or A? Thought it was flipped, okay. So let's go A here. Okay, go ahead and turn that off. Everyone's okay with this one? Okay. All right, some other safety things. Go ahead and turn this light on really quick. I wanna talk about safety. A Couple of things. Um, you're going to probably notice, because we're working in the dark, you're going to probably notice uh, a couple of times we might trip, okay? Because of the cables that are running everywhere, you do want to be aware of that when you're on set. And one thing that you probably should do is get in the habit of taping down your cables. If you look uh, over here from the uh, camera to the monitor that we have, we have, um, the, have it taped down so no one is going to trip and fall. But because of we're moving all these lights around uh, quickly, uh, we are not going to tape these down just because we're moving them around. So be aware of that when you're on set. You're probably going to need to get some gaff tape and tape cables down so people don't trip over them or get a carpet or something that you can put down uh, over the cables so that people don't do that. Second thing, you've noticed that I put on a pair of gloves, okay? These are just regular leather work gloves. You can just get them at Home Depot or, you know, Ace Hardware or wherever, not an endorsement. Um, because quartz halogen lights are going to get hot. These things get really, really hot. Um, and all the parts of this light are made of metal. So if you've ever touched a hot stove, you probably learned, never gonna do that again. You need to get leather gloves. The other thing is your hands are gonna get slippery uh, as you work throughout the day. The leather gloves are gonna continue to give you a good grip uh, throughout, the, throughout, the, uh, throughout the day. So get a pair of good gloves when you're working with these lights especially, okay? So we have, go ahead and turn off that light again. We have, um, this hard light, we've got it kind of in our starting position that we want it. And you might, you might be saying, but I really want this to be a little softer. How can we make this light a little softer? Well, depending on the light kits that you get or the things that you might check out, you have a couple of options. The first is this umbrella, okay? This is kind of like a photographer's umbrella. It's got a reflective surface on the inside. It is also somewhat semi-transparent, but um, there is a flag holder up here that I'm just going to slide this into. Other thing, uh, some other kind of safety things as I'm putting this one in, as you're working with these light stands, make sure that you are being super, super careful uh, with these light stands and are not letting them just crash, meaning you're not letting them uh, just fall to the floor. Let's see if I can get this in all the way. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, make sure you're not just loosening these things and letting the light fall down, uh, because that can destabilize the um, that can destabilize the bulb, cause it to break. It's just like a, a a regular household light bulb, except it's more hot and more bright. So this has got the reflector on the inside. So one thing we could do is we could use the reflector, go ahead and brighten that up a little bit, to bring the light back into that space. That's one option. That's a little bit softer. It's not as hard or harsh. That does look a little bit better. Uh, the other option is to use a piece of diffusion. Uh, diffusion material uh, can be purchased at, you know, theatrical supply stores. Here it comes back at you again. Um, and these can be attached to a frame. And so I'm just going to slide this one in. Now this one won't diffuse as much as the, um, as the umbrella. 
but this is a little softer light. Get that in there so we're getting, getting that triangle under the eyes. Now the other thing you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, is how when I add the diffusion material, how the light starts to spread out even more. So uh, real quick, I'm gonna just pull this up. Notice how the background, notice the light on the background. And then as I bring this up, notice that we have no light on that background. But the minute we drop that diffusion material in, that background also lights up. So diffusion material is spreading the light out. Okay, it's making it big. Uh, we could get a big sheet of diffusion material like we saw on the light dome a moment ago. And the bigger that diffusion material, the brighter the light is going to be. Okay? Or the more spread out the light is going to be, the bigger the light is going to be. So I'm just going to raise this back up so we can get back into that. So this is the key light. Questions about the key light? All right. Now. While it may be sometimes perfectly acceptable to have a high contrast ratio like we have here, where we have very distinct lines, very distinct shadows, uh, this is probably not, you know, if I, if I was going to, um, the witness is telling a scary story, right, or a subject is telling a scary story, this might be something where we might have some high contrast lighting, where it's dark shadows and very bright lights. But more often than not, we want something to look natural. And so what we want is low contrast lighting. We need to figure out a way to diffuse those shadows or to lighten those shadows. The best way to do that, of course, is to add a fill light. Okay, so the fill light, its primary responsibility is to fill in the shadows. Uh, and again, there are a couple of ways that we can do this. I'm just going to go ahead and turn on this light. Light on. Uh, back this. I'm going to back this light out. Because if I keep this at the same distance, uh, we'll just start here. Notice that we've basically removed all the shadows from the shot. We have a light that is the same intensity as the light on the other side. And we've removed all the shadows. Plus, our subject now is squinting. And we've actually, if we look carefully, we've actually created two sets of shadows. We have, if you look under the chin again, you can see a shadow going off to the left and a shadow going off to the right. That's not what we want. So there are a couple of ways that we can change the intensity of the light. Anybody know one of them? What's that? Distance. What does distance have to do with the intensity of the light? Remember we talked about this in class. Remember the inverse square law? All I have to do is move this light back twice the distance, and I'm going to cut the amount of light by 75%, right? So if I just move this back, double the distance, notice how much less light we have in the scene. And if I were to take this back even further, now we have even less light in that scene. But notice that we haven't gotten rid of that light completely. Notice that those shadows have changed. I don't know what our distance is here, but we're probably at a six to one. So we have a fairly low contrast ratio here. But notice how we still see the other side of her face. We can see her whole face. We still have dimension to her face thanks to the shadows. This looks pretty good, starting to look a lot better. Again, let's compare to where we were before to where we were after. That looks pretty good. Problem is, we're in a big studio. We're in a big sound stage, right? Well, not a super big sound stage, but we are in a big studio space. If you're in somebody's office, you're not going to have the ability to move your light back 20 feet or 12 feet. So another way that we can reduce the amount of light falling on our scene is by using some diffusion material. Or, I'm sorry, not diffusion but material. Um, let's see if I've got a sheet here. Oh, all I've got is a big long sheet. Um, this is a piece of neutral density filter 
uh, material, gel, okay? And we've talked before about neutral density filters in that they are basically sunglasses for your camera, but they can also be a way to knock down the light, uh, the intensity of a light. And so you can just see if I hold this up here, I haven't moved the light at all. It's the same distance as we were when we were starting. But notice that we are basically back to that lighting look that we had when the light was 12 feet away. Would you agree? I'm only seeing this because I don't see it from the, from the monitor. Does it look about right, Brandon? Yeah? So the problem is I have this big sheet of gel. It's not going to fit on a little gel holder like this. So how can I attach gels to my light when they're this big? Well, one thing that we can do is use what's called a C47. Does anybody know what a C47 is? Ladies and gentlemen, the infamous C47. But I know what you're thinking. Stephen, this is just a wooden clothespin. Why are you calling it a C47? Because I could say I need $1,000 for C47s, and someone who's not in the know is probably going to say, okay, that's fine, that's a good budget item. But if I said I need $1,000 for wooden clothespins, they're going to say, you're insane, you're out of your mind. So a long time ago, we started using jargon as a way to maybe pad out our budgets a little bit. Uh, but one thing about using a C47, a wooden clothespin, is that it does need to be a wooden clothespin. Remember I said these things get really, really hot. If you put a plastic clothespin on there, it's going to melt. Could ca cause a fire, all that other stuff. So this looks pretty good. All we did was add a little piece of gel, neutral density gel, to the front of our light. But what if I told you in this three-point light setup that we don't even need this light at all? One nice thing about lights, go ahead and turn on the overheads if you would, and then if you would bring me that uh, reflector, please. One thing about lights is that they reflect and bounce everywhere. And if you have a shiny surface or a white surface or any kind of surface, you can use another light to bounce light back onto the subject. So here I have a reflector. This is just a pop-up reflector. Go ahead and turn off that light again, please. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this reflector to take the light from my key light. I'm bouncing it into the reflector. And then that light is bouncing off the reflector and into the subjects or onto the subject's face. Okay? Um, bring this down just a little bit, I think, if I can. Probably not. Um, there we go. Is that out of the shot? Yeah, there we go. So these reflectors are available for checkout. These are available online. You can get them fairly inexpensively. Uh, these are the best ones that you can find are the five-in-one uh, reflectors because they will have a silver side, they will have a gold side, they will have a mixed side, they'll have a black side, and then they'll have oftentimes some kind of a diffuser. So we talked about you know, adding a diffuser or some kind of diffusion material in front of a light. This is really big. If we were to take this and put it out in front of our light, we could take this hard light and turn it instantly into a giant soft light. Okay? And I know a lot of people are just like, hey, we need to get soft lights, soft lights, soft lights. The soft lights are, have become pretty much um, the common light to use in the industry when lighting interviews. But I want to show you guys that you can get these same results with hard lights and some ingenuity. Okay? So we now have two lights in our scene. Uh, one is, well, actually, we have one light in our scene, and we're using the reflector to, to light our subject. But if you needed to use a second light, you could. How's this looking? 
Let's just uh, do a test. Go ahead and turn on the overheads, please. Go ahead and open up your iris. Here's where we started. Here's where we started. Okay, go ahead. Turn off the lights. Light on. Just our iris down. There we go. And here's where we're at now. What do we know aesthetically about this image? What do we know aesthetically about this image? It's warmer, right? Okay, remember the overhead lights, fluorescent lights that have a, a higher uh, Kelvin rating, a higher color temperature than these incandescent, or not incandescent, but these quartz halogen lamps. Because we've white balanced correctly, we get a much warmer presence on the screen. What else? More contrast is going on in the scene. Puts the attention on the subject and not the background. Good. You see how this really changes the dynamics of our shot with just one light and one reflector. Okay, but I promised that this was going to be a three-point lighting demonstration. So let's bring in a second light. Now, one of the problems that we have in this shot is that our subject looks great. Okay, lit very, very well, but the problem is there's a very quick fall off between the back of the subject's head and our background. Our background is essentially dark, completely dark at the moment. We can still see some highlights because of the uh, diffusion material, um, but there's not a lot of separation between the subject and the background. The subject looks really, really flat. So, a couple of things that we can do. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add in a rim light. Uh, sometimes you'll see it at, called a, a side light. Uh, hold on just a second. I'm looking for one. Okay, let's go back to, to this light right here. I'm going to bring in kind of a rim light, shoulder light. I really need a, a longer extension cord if somebody could flip this around for me. <laughs> That's all right. So in, if we're talking about jargon, we talked about C47s. Uh, industry jargon that you will hear for an extension cord. Does anybody know uh, who, who may be working in this uh, area already? We refer to these as stingers. Stingers. And for tripods, uh, you will refer, you will often hear them referred to as sticks. Headphones will be referred to as cans. So a little bit of jargon talk here. So what I want to do is I want to try to separate now my subject from the background. And I'm going to spot this in as much as I can. I still don't want it to be Super, super bright. I mean, I could, depending on the aesthetic quality that I'm going for, but let's just start here. Notice that this, I'm going to call this a backlight. It's not, it's not specifically a, a rim light. You'll see the difference between the two in a moment. But here we have this light that is hitting the subject on the opposite side of the key light. So typically we will want to put this uh, backlight uh, on the opposite side of the fill. And notice that it is really lighting up that subject and providing a lot more uh, contrast into our scene. Okay? This looks a heck of a lot better already. Even if I were to flood this out, we will see that it still creates a nice, pleasing, pleasing light. One thing, though, that when we talk about contrast, another thing that we will often do is use color to create contrast. And so not only do we have gels that can be used to, let's see, what color do we have here? That's a neutral density one. Oh, I don't have a blue gel. Do we have a blue gel? Uh, Nathan, can you come look in the uh, kits and see if there's a, a blue gel? I thought I had one sitting out here. So these kits do come with gels. 
let's see. Okay. Well, we'll use purple. We'll use what we have available to us. But oftentimes you will see uh, people use some colored gels. Oh, okay, good. That's a little bit smaller. I'll, I'll use this big one, I think, for the moment, just since we already have this big one. I'm just going to double up these gels. And maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just use the... purplish gel. There are gels that actually change the color temperature of the light. Um, if I had one of those here, if I had the blue CTB gel, color temperature blue, you could also get ones that are color temperature orange. This one is pretty dark though, a pretty intense gel. Now remember gels are just plastic. They tend to be a little bit heat resistant, but they're not always color resistant. So over time these gels can fade. But now we've added a little bit of contrast or a little bit of color contrast into our, into our scene. That looks pretty cool. And we could use other colors too, but you know, in, you, as you'll go through coursework and as you go online, you'll see a lot of people talking about uh, teal and orange, and since I don't have my light blue CT, uh, CTB gel, uh, we've got the orange coming from our warm light. We have the cool light on the background. So this is our backlight, and this is something we can use. Uh, another light we could use if we wanted to, and Nathan, I'm going to need your help uh, getting this one plugged in, is we can use what's called a rim light. And a rim light, the purpose of a rim light is to rim the subject, the head and the shoulders, and kind of create a halo of light uh, around the subject. Now, another safety thing. I have not tested this light at all. Uh, so I don't know if the switch is on or off. So before Nathan plugs that in, I'm just going to tilt this light up just in case it's turned on so I'm not blinding anybody or in case there is a problem, someone's not standing right in front of the light. Uh, right in their face. So go ahead and plug that in. Okay, light on. Okay. So this light, I've mounted on a C stand. We'll talk about C stands here in just a minute. But I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to get this light to hit right on the head and shoulders of our subject. Okay, let's see. I'm going to use the spot to just kind of see where the light is falling, and then I'll flood it out a little bit. Now, attached to these lights, these are the Omni lights, uh, are barn doors. Barn doors are there to help shape light, to control the light, to keep light from spilling in areas where you don't want. In this case, depending on where I put this, put these barn doors, I don't know if See, right there, light is shining into the camera. And we can see some lens flare. And we can also see how dirty that lens is, right? Probably not something we want. But if that's where we need to, I can just bring my barn door down, shape that light so it's not falling to the left or to the right. And I want to make sure that it's falling right on the shoulders of my subject. And there we have a rim light. That looks really good. I like that a lot. Now, if we were to lose the, the back, uh, this uh, side light or backlight, we still have a pleasing image. Still looks good. If we wanted to bring a little bit more twinkle back into the eye, turn this back on. Remember you said this light here on the front was not super noticeable. But now that we turn that on, notice how we got a little pinpoint of light in her eyes and how that makes her eyes kind of come alive a little bit more, sparkle a little bit more. Without, go ahead and look. And with, just a little bit. Now you can use 
pin lights, you can use flashlights, you can use you know, lights like this if you want to. That creates that little extra sparkle right there in the face and in the eyes. Uh, the only other light that we don't have at the moment is lighting our background. We still would kind of like to see a little bit about where our subject is, so I'm going to take this total light. This is a broad light. I'm not really going to do much with this light except to just throw some light onto the background. And if I wanted to, it may be too intense. I could stop that down. Maybe a little too low. Maybe I'll bring it up. This is where you really get into what is the, what is the purpose of this scene? What are you trying to do in this scene? What are you trying to say in this scene? So there we go. We have right now, well, not counting that little light, we have three lights lighting this scene, okay? Not counting that little light. And if we turn on this broad light or the side light, we'll have four lights. You can do this. This doesn't take very long. The first time you do it, it takes a little practice, but then as you start to work with lights, and especially doing interviews, you can create some really dramatic lighting situations for any kind of a talking situation, okay? We can use this as a basis for expanding out of an interview situation to uh, doing something narrative that you might do for film, okay? We can expand this out for uh, a talk show if we needed to, same principles, okay? But if you're doing corporate video, if you're doing news and you're doing interviews, here's a good place to start with lights. And if you only have hard light sources, you can certainly use those, but there are ways to change that light and diffuse that light and create it a lot more uh, soft light situation. Final thing I want to talk about, a couple of things that I want to talk about. Uh, first, let's go ahead and turn on the light really quick. I have been using these stands right here. These are Century stands, C stands, you will hear them referred to as C stands. Uh, the name comes from Century Stand, the company that used to make these things. Also, people call them Century Stands because they literally will last 100 years. I remember when I was working in uh, California and we were setting up a, a streaming uh, system, we had to go buy some C stands and we found some that were cheap and we brought them back to the studio and we started kind of cleaning them up a little bit. And sure enough, stamped right on the bottom of the C stand was Manufacture date, 1932, and these things work great, okay? So C-stands are really, really useful. A couple of things about C-stands is that, uh, number one, if you're going to use the boom arm extension on these, you have to be really, really careful because if you were to swing this light around the other way, uh, I'm just going to swing it around this way just so we can see what's going on. And I would tighten this down. Let's see which way is tight. If I put a heavy weight on this side of the C-stand, this thing eventually over time is just going to loosen up and is going to hit somebody, okay? So you always want to make sure you put the C-stand on the correct side or the right side because in this position, it only gets tighter as it falls down. Okay, so you don't have to worry as much about the subject or somebody getting hit. Uh, the other thing, if you are using C-stands, these are dark. They can come in black or they can come in silver. Man, I have busted my face on these a million times. That's why I look the way I do, right? So a couple of things that you can do. Uh, get some tennis balls, okay? Cut them in half. Stick them on the ends of your C-stands because that's way if somebody's walking through, they're going to see that and save their face, save their eye. Uh, you can also get a piece of green gaff tape or something to hang off so that people see these things uh, in the dark. Because it is hard to see these in the dark. Uh, the reason why I chose black is because I don't want these showing up uh, in a camera when I've got all the lights turned off. Okay? Second thing is, on these C-stands, now I have a specific type of uh, um, leggings on this C-stand. These are um, collapsible, stackable legs. Uh, but notice that there's one leg that is taller than the rest. I tend to try to put 
these with the longest leg or the strongest leg pointing towards the heaviest side of the C-stand. Again, like we are talking with tripods, this is going to be a lot less likely to tip over as opposed to if it was, if this was pointing out this way where it could fall over this way. Okay? Third thing, again, super, be super safe if you're using C-stands. Third thing that you, we need to talk about with safety, especially with C-stands or light stands in general, is these things will tip over easily. Notice that we have a bunch of heavy stuff on a relatively small base, a really heavy light on a relatively small base. You need to use sandbags, okay? It's a sandbag, it's a bag full of sand, okay? You need to put these on the legs of your stands so that these don't tip over, okay? You need to do this on all your lights. Now, we haven't been paying much attention to safety today just because of time uh, and because we're all kind of aware of what's going on. But putting your sandbags, even if it's just one, on your light can help stabilize it and help keep it from tipping over. I can't stress enough that safety should always be your number one priority whenever you're on set. You don't want people tripping. You don't want uh, things falling on people. You don't want people getting burned. You don't want people getting cut. You don't want people getting damaged in any way, shape, or form because that comes back on your production company in the form of lawsuits. And if you are found oftentimes in violation of creating a safety hazard, people aren't going to want to work with you. You can be banned from certain locations. So sandbags, very, very, very important. Okay, let's turn this light off one more time. And let's just walk this backwards. So here is our background light. Literally the point of the background light is to light the background. Here we have a rim light. The purpose of the rim light is to separate the subject from the background and to create a halo or a rim. Notice how it kind of, especially with you have a, a lighter hair, it causes that to kind of bloom and look really pretty. But that is our rim light. We have a backlight that we can use with a gel, or in this case I am using it with a gel, to create some color contrast between our subject. I've got an eye light that is just providing a little extra twinkle to the eye. The purpose of the fill light is to fill in the shadows. In this case, we're using a reflector or a bounce card. You can go to um, your favorite hobby store and you can get a piece of a white foam core board. Serves the same purpose and can be used in the same way. Cost a lot less than this, okay? And finally, the key light is our principal source of illumination. And it basically sets the stage for how we want our audience to feel. Sets the mood, time, location, et cetera. Okay, go ahead and turn that on. That's a huge difference. This is what, when we talk about creating something that looks pleasing, that looks professional, that looks like you've gone above and beyond, something like what we have set up today uh, really, I think, demonstrates that. And it's not hard, okay? I know we spent 45 minutes here going through all this, setting this up. You can get this down to like 10 minutes, okay, or less. If you know what your, your scene is when you come in, you can simply step in, get your light set up, and go. Now, this setup is not going to work in every single situation. Okay? In somebody's crowded office, you're not going to be able to do a three light setup like this. So you're going to have to improvise. And when we get into the advanced video class, we'll talk about how do you improvise, how do you take, go from this three point setup to something simpler, to something that still looks as good, but you use your environment to help light your scene. Okay? Um, Am I forgetting anything? I think I've covered everything. Do, 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 do. You guys think of anything that I'm missing? Probably not. Okay. Um, do any of you have any questions about this light setup? Hopefully you were taking notes, because you know I don't do a demonstration without then saying, hey, wait a minute, this is something you guys should practice. So not this week, but next week you'll have an assignment that will involve lighting. Okay. Any questions? Yes. 
Key light is your main source, your fill light, and then your back light, your side light, your rim light, one of those others. Okay? But key and fill are your most important. Then separating the subject from the background is going to be your next priority. Okay? Any other questions? Well, no, I wouldn't worry about the eye light too much. I was just showing that as a way that you can add a little bit more twinkle into the eye. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you could try to lower this down a little bit more and get some more light shining in the eye. Uh, and that's ideally, let me just turn this back on again. The light on. Um, you can see in this shot, you can see we are getting a little bit of twinkle in the eye. You see that, that it's there. Uh, but by turning this on, we're just adding just just that little bit more punch. And, and interestingly, it's the reflection of the light in the eye, the specular highlight of the eyeball. That's what causes this scene to really come to life. If we had no light, go ahead and turn that light off. If we had no light shining on her eyes, let's see if I can get it to a point where we don't. Getting there. Let me just move this this way just a little bit more. If we didn't have any light shining in her eyes, and I think we still have just a little bit, no offense, but she kind of looks a little dead. She doesn't look like she has a lot of life to her. So we want to add that light into the scene to make the subject come alive. And this is true, whoops, safety first, right? Um, this is true whether you're working in animation. This is true, whoops, did I lose audio there, Gary? Okay. This is true if you're working in animation. This is true if you're working in corporate video. This is true if you're working in film. Uh, that eye light really causes your subject to come alive. And so adding that back in does just that. Other questions? Yes. Come on down. That's all right. All right, so glasses. What do we know about the glasses? Do we have a lot of glare and reflection? Look right here. Do we have a lot of, got a little bit of shadow. So these are times where we might need to break away from that 45 degree rule and maybe bring this in a little bit closer. Something like that. Today, most of your glasses are, um, have the anti-reflective coating on there. Used to be when I was a kid, many years ago, back in the dinosaurs roamed the world, um, glasses were horrible on camera because they just reflect all the light and be 100% op you know, uh, opaque. Uh, so it was horrible to try to light glasses. But today, glasses aren't that big of a deal. Notice that even though we've broken from the 45-45 rule, we still have the triangle of light right under the eye. We can still see the eyes. Um, and when, if we were to add everything back in, uh, a lot of those hard shadows from the from the glasses would go back uh, would go away. Okay, good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Can't do we want to get rid of the room light as much as we can? Go ahead and have a seat. Not necessarily because if we are going to set up things like this. Well, that looks kind of cool. Uh, I probably, in this case, I'm going to, I would gel, I would knock the intensity down of this rim light just for the way we have this, this set. There we go. Um, but notice with the ambient light in the room, it kind of serves as a basis for us to still be able to see the environment without needing to add a environment light or a background light. Also, this light, this C-stand, I need to back this back this out of our scene because we don't want it in our shot and that's why it's on this arm. Does that answer your question? Okay, so yes, we can have all these lights on but I wouldn't use it as my principal source of illumination. Use it as a base light uh, to kind of help, help the overall scene. Other questions?
Okay, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you in the intensive video production class for coming and making this possible today. Um, have a good and safe Oktoberfest, and we will see everyone next week.